Okay, so uh, welcome back. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Lorenzo Monacelli. Uh, Lorenzo is the postdoctoral researcher at EPFL in Japan. He's the core developer of the SHA code, which can uh, be used to compute phonons with an harmonicity. Uh, and the topic uh, of today's lecture is beyond harmonic phonons, phase diagrams, and phase transitions with quantum and thermal effects. Lorenzo, the, the stage is there. Thank you very much, Yuri, for the introduction and all the organizers for inviting me here. Uh, so this is a school on advanced electronic structure methods. So what you did yesterday in the Anson session, and I expect you to do also tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, is uh, solving the electronic structure problem, treating the nuclei as fixed particle uh, in the position you constrain them to be in your input file. Uh, but today is the day of lattice dynamics, so is the day in which we break this approximation, and we actually uh, try to understand how the dynamics of lattice and dynamics of ions affect the properties of the material. So uh, Paolo presented this morning the harmonic approximation and how to compute harmonic phonons within density functional theory, and I will try to present you how to go beyond this approximation in this uh, uh, lecture and in the absolute section of uh, this act. So lattice vibrations are extremely important because they affect many properties of the materials. Uh, and uh, uh, among some of the most important properties are thermal expansion that you cannot explain without uh, lattice uh, dynamics uh, and heat capacity. Also, the capacity of material is due to phonons and uh, vibration on ions, thermal conductivity, because the limiting factor of thermal conductivity in most uh, cases is actually the lattice, uh, the phonon scattering, so the, the heat that uh, uh, is propagating to phonons, and so lattice vibrations. Structural changes and many phase transition are actually uh, all uh, related and due to uh, lattice uh, properties, as I will show you. And then also, as Samuel showed you in the previous lecture, electronic properties can be strongly renormalized and affected by lattice uh, uh, dynamics. And in particular, some of the very interesting and phenomena like superconductivity cannot explain without uh, lattice uh, uh, vibrations. And so uh, almost anything, any property that you can think of that depends on temperature at temperature which is not thousands of Kelvin, is probably due to lattice and phonons because the energy excitation, typical excitation energy of phonons are on the same scale as room temperature. So uh, you are able with standard uh, room temperature to excite lattice uh, excited states while electrons, typical energy scale of excitation is way higher. And so mostly temperature, it's there are cases in which it plays a role, but they are very rare cases. So if you think of a property that depends on temperature, probably this is related to lattice dynamics, not directly to electrons, or indirectly to electrons, indeed. So why uh, 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 ions vibrate inside a crystal? So they are not frozen, but they are affected by two different kinds of vibrations, if you want. And they are both can be thermal, so due to the presence of a finite temperature, and also at zero Kelvin, as someone also was uh, pointing out before, there are uh, the, there are quantum fluctuations which uh, make the system not to be frozen on a, a static uh, position. And you can understand this thermal fluctuation by thinking about the free energy of the system. And the free energy of the system is composed by the internal energy, which includes potential energy and kinetic energy. Now, this is, uh, we are uh, speaking about ions, so potential energy of ions in the born of an ion approximation is the energy, the ground state energy of electrons when we fix ion to that position. The kinetic energy, I'm referring also to the movement of ions, so how it contributes to the kinetic energy. And then we have temperature and entropy. And in this case, uh, entropy uh, means that we can have a probability distribution to finding ions in some position. So uh, if we allow ions to vibrate and we uh, take a snapshot of our system, we will have a probability to finding ions around the uh, average position, which is a kind of probability, which the broader this probability is, the more uncertainty somehow I have on that position. And so the higher the, the entropy is. 
So you can immediately see that uh, to minimize the free energy, which is our ground state at finite temperature of the system, we have two competing effects. One effect is the effect of temperature that wants to maximize the entropy. So to maximize the entropy, we must somehow spread our probability distribution. And so there is a competition here because the more we spread the probability distribution, the more we start sampling position of ions in which, um, in which the, the energy will be higher. And so this term here, the, the broader the, the distribution will make the free energy increase while entropy will also increase. And so there is a competition between these two. So the higher the temperature, the more the entropy will prevail. And so the more we, we will displace from the equilibrium position. If the temperature is zero, this term doesn't appear. So it seems that the best position in which we put the ions is very narrow around the minimum. But then there are also quantum fluctuations. And in particular, there is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which state that if we localize, so the uncertainty of our position times the uncertainty of our momentum of the particles as a lower bound. So it means that if we localize too much around the minimum of the energy, we will have a high value of the momentum. And this will give a contribution to the kinetic energy. So if we localize too much around the minimum, we will have a very high value of the kinetic energy. And so the final value of the free energy will be very high. And so also these two effects compete each other, even in absence of temperature, and means that we will have a non-finite a finite fluctuation of ions around their equilibrium position, even if the temperature is zero due to quantum fluctuations. So as you can see, these two phenomena are very different because while this depends only on the distribution, probability distribution, this one here depends also on the mass of nuclei. So this uh, kind of effect of quantum fluctuation is actually affected by isotope effects, while temperature not. not. Uh, so, uh, so they are both mechanisms that makes atoms vibrate, but they actually qualitative and quantitative behavior is very different. And they, and they are both present simultaneously in uh, all the materials. So uh, what was introduced uh, before was the harmonic approximation to treat lattice. Let me re uh, re recall a bit how it works. So what we do is that we will have our uh, potential energy landscape for the ions, which is the, for each position in which we imagine we could put the ions is the ground state of the electron energy. And harmonic approximation say, okay, let's uh, put ourselves in the minimum of this uh, position, which is uh, where you will end up after a uh, relaxation. So if you do a variable cell relaxation with quantum espresso, you will end up in the minimum of this, uh, in a local minimum of this, uh, uh, potential energy landscape. And then to compute properties of lattice vibration, we can expand the potential around the minimum uh, up to second order, because since the force on ions is zero at the, at the minimum of the potential, the lowest non-trivial perturbation theory we can do is second order on the atomic position. And this is what you compute with the FPT and what was shown by Paolo before. And so you end up with something with a potential, which is approximated in this way. So this is the energy of your uh, position at equilibrium, at equilibrium, plus this term, which is the harmonic uh, potential. And this is the force constant matrix. Sorry for the different notation. It was called C in uh, Paula lecture. And, uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, and this is how, and I use a, a only two indices here instead of four, each index uh, uh, indicate both the atomic uh, uh, index and the Cartesian coordinate. So they go between one and three, okay? To simplify a bit the notation. And uh, indeed, as I was telling you, this is the second derivative with respect to uh, ionic position uh, computed at the equi local equilibrium. So this is the harmonic approximation. Now, this is very nice because harmonic uh, theory, uh, uh, we, we have a solution for uh, the harmo this harmonic Hamiltonian, and uh, uh, we can solve it at, uh, in the quantum mechanic framework. We have all the excited states, and now if this is done, it's quite easy. We diagonalize this uh, 
force constant matrix defining the so-called polarization vector and uh, frequencies of the four modes. And then along each one of these modes, we have the energy of the excited state, which are H bar omega half to uh, two n plus one, which is the solution of the quantum harmonic uh, oscillator. Thanks to this, we have all, since we know also the excited state, we can define the density matrix of our system, which is simply the sum of all excited states, and we know them, I just don't write here because of space, uh, but if you look to Wikipedia, there is the expression for all excited states of harmonic uh, oscillators, and here we have this Boltzmann occupation factor, so each state is occupied by this factor here where the energy is this one here. And then we have the partition function here, which is simply the sum over all these weights, which is a, a geometric series because if you substitute this here, you see this is something elevated to the n. And so it's an infinite series that can be solved analytically. So we have an analytical expression for the partition function. And since we have an analytical expression for the partition function, we have an analytical expression for the free energy, which is this one here in the end. So which is the energy, again, of the minimum of the electronic uh, potential plus, uh, the, so, sorry, the ionic potential, plus uh, this term here, which is the harmonic uh, term of the free energy. So it's summed over all formal modes in the system, uh, times this expression here, which is really uh, quite simple. And thanks to the fact that we have an analytical expression to the free energy, we can compute thermodynamic quantities analytically. So for example, entropy is the derivative of the free energy with respect to temperature. Heat capacity is the second derivative with respect to temperature. So if you want, is the derivative of the entropy. And so we have access to heat capacity. We have access to many thermodynamic uh, properties directly within the harmonic approximation. So it's very important and very powerful. Uh, not only, we have also access to the probability distribution of ions, because we can bracket our density matrix with a position operator, and this bracket can be computed analytically, actually, and we end up with a probability distribution of finding ions, which is a Gaussian uh, probability distribution, where this term here is the inverse of the covariance matrix of this Gaussian, and can be written uh, in this way in the, in the basis of the agent modes. And the, this term here, as you can see, is the only part that depends on temperature. And the dependence on temperature of this uh, inverse covariance matrix, which quantify how much atom uh, shift around the equilibrium position, is given by the Bose Einstein occupation factor here. So the more the temperature increase, the higher uh, the spread around the equilibrium value will be. So the, the smaller will be this term here. But you can see, as I was anticipating, these also include quantum fluctuations, because if we put temperature equal to zero here, this uh, uh, exponentially diverges. And so one over, over infinite gives zero. And so we don't have this term here, but still we have uh, something which is finite, which is two omega. OK, so we get also the effect of a, a, a finite spreading of the probability of finding ions around our average position, which is non-zero, even at equal zero, which is quantum fluctuation. So this treatment of harmonic uh, approximation gives us also access to uh, both quantum and thermal uh, distribution. However, harmonic approximation uh, fail in many cases. And let's have a look what harmonic approximation can explain. So first of all, let me return back a moment. I tell, told you that the only place in which temperature enters here is here. Particularly, the average position doesn't depend on temperature. Not only the frequency of uh, the phonons do not depend on temperature. So for example, we cannot explain thermal expansion. And when, the reason is that uh, since la, uh, the position of our atom don't depend on temperature, the lattice do not expand. So if you take a, a system only uh, connecting uh, atoms with springs only, harmonic springs only, you increase the temperature, it will not expand with temperature if it is completely harmonic. We need some degree of harmonicity to explain the thermal expansion. 
We cannot explain the second order phase transition, which are related to structure of change, because again, if they are related, if we have an order parameter that is related to some structural change in the phase, it means the atoms are changing with temperature. And uh, again, harmonic theory don't explain change of atomic position with temperature. So we fail. If our phonon frequency depends on temperature, we cannot explain this dependence because, uh, again, frequency, we diagonalize uh, the dynamical matrix uh, uh, at a certain structure, and we don't have effective temperature. And also, phonons may have a finite lifetime. It means that if we measure phonons, we may find a finite line width uh, and band dispersion. And why, in the harmonic theory, phonons don't scatter each other are agent values, agent values so, uh, of our uh, uh, Hamiltonian. So if we excite a phonon, it will remain in this excited state forever. And then there are also other aspects, like more complex, like anomalous isotope effects. So isotope effect is present in the harmonic theory because it accounts for quantum effects. But there are some systems, and I will show you one, in which if we, if we change mass, things don't go as we would expect from harmonic theory, and many other which, uh, phenomena which I don't have time to go all of them together. But let's see a practical case in which the failure is quite big of our monitor approximation. This is a rock salt structure of palladium hydride. And uh, so this is a structure that exists at uh, ambient uh, pressure and is a superconductor, actually a low temperature. And it's particularly interesting because the H atom, the hydrogen atom are very light atoms. And so they feel a lot the quantum fluctuations. Uh, so, uh, and this is a superconductor with an inverse isotope effect. So the superconductive temperature increase if we replace hydrogen with deuterium. This is uh, not predicted by the DCS theory, it's the opposite, and actually it should happen. And so this is one of the cases in which there is already here a strongly, uh, a strong uh, marker of uh, uh, failure of our harmonic theory. And if we uh, plot, we do a calculation with quantum expression of phonons, like exactly like Paolo was showing you before, what we observe is that this structure that we know is a stable structure has imaginary phonons, which means our system is on a subtle point of a global minimum of the energy landscape. And not only this is uh, uh, the experimental value obs observed uh, for the phonon, uh, for the from the special gamma, we have only gamma because since hydrogen is almost invisible to uh, X-ray and other probes, uh, it's almost diffi very difficult to do the, the full dispersion experimentally in this material. So we have to rely to Raman and infrared spectrum to measure phonons only at gamma. But if you can see here, we are uh, underestimating the phonon frequency by a factor of five. So the real phonon frequency is about 500. We predict uh, as bit uh, higher than 100 centimeters to one. So it's a clear uh, signature of the failure of uh, our harmonic theory. And this failure remains present if we substitute hydrogen with deuterium and if we treat uh, even if things get a bit better, but not that much. Uh, so how can we go beyond harmonic phonons? That's the major, the main part of this lecture. So uh, we can do exactly like what we did in uh, let's say functional theory. So we have a theory which is harmonic phonons, which uh, is very really beautiful because uh, many many quantities are actually analytical. We can access to many uh, things, but we want to go beyond, and we so we do. Harmonic phonons, but this time self consistently. A bit like in density functional theory, you say independent electrons are so beautiful, we can do a lot of things with them, it's very easy to solve. But we want to include some kind, somehow, the effect of electron electron interaction. So we do independent electrons, but self consistently. So the idea behind is, a bit, is very similar. And as in density functional theory, we can formalize this as a uh, variational principle and as a minimization. So what we actually do is we take again the free energy, which is our functional that we want to minimize. And we take the, this is the exact real free energy, is the minimum, again, all possible density matrix of the system of the internal energy, which is nothing less than the average of our Hamiltonian computer with the density matrix, 
minus temperature entropy of this density matrix. Now, this is exact. In principle, if we are able to do this minimization among all possible density matrix, we find the exact solution. Problem is that, uh, as, as you can imagine, it's extremely complex to do this. And so we need to do some kind of approximation. And the approximation is that we restrict the uh, density matrix only to density matrices, which are solution of auxiliary harmonic Hamiltonians. This is very similar. You can to what is done in density functional theory, but this time with phonons. So this is uh, how we can write the density matrix in a harmonic case. Now, these are auxiliary harmonic Hamiltonian here has no, me no physical meaning in principle, exactly like the Koneshama Hamiltonian has no physical meaning for electrons. Uh, but it's very useful because uh, we now have a lot of quantities that are analytical. And for example, we have the probability distribution, which is a Gaussian. And, uh, uh, and not only this, we now have only we have restricted the variational dimension of a density matrix, which is as uh, the exponential explosion, which was mentioned also yesterday, into something that depends only on two parameters, which is the position of the average position of ions and the effective force constant matrix. Okay, so these two quantities have <laughs> no direct physical meaning, except this as a bit more clear, which is the average position of ions. And you can see since this uh, minimization depends on the temperature, then the result of the minimization will depend on temperature. So you can already see that the position of your atoms, the average position of your atoms in the lattice now depends implicitly here on the temperature. So you can immediately see how this goes beyond the harmonic uh, phonons. And what we do actually is to minimize the speed energy with respect to these two parameters, so the average position and this effective force constant matrix. Uh, okay, so this is just a way to the cast uh, the uh, expression for the free energy. And here is an example. So this is a one dimensional system in which we have here uh, an example of uh, born of Penheimer energy landscape, so the potential energy of our one-dimensional ion. And uh, we can solve it in the harmonic approximation. And what we get is we must find the minimum, and then we expand up to second order around the minimum, the potential, and we find which is the uh, probability distribution of finding the ions according to the harmonic Hamiltonian we find in this way, and this, that, this red line here. Here in dash black is the exact solution. Uh, so numerically, so as you can see, it's quite different. If we optimize in the, instead with the self-consistent harmonic approximation, we get a Gaussian dispersion because we have uh, our density matrix will be solution of an auxiliary harmonic Hamiltonian, but this time it will match much better uh, with the exact solution. So this is a sketch of how the theory works in a one-dimensional system. So how it works in practice, the code to uh, do this uh, kind of minimization. And so uh, it's the, the keyword is the stochastic. So it's, this is the reason why it's S-S-C-H-A, because it's stochastic, so it's an harmonic approximation. And so we start in practice from a guess of our average ionic position and effective force constant matrix, which can be the result of the, this is the result of a variable star relaxation with quantum espresso, and this is the result of harmonic calculation. And uh, then you compute the, you extract a random ensemble according to the probability distribution that depends on the average position, the effective force constant matrix that determines the phonon frequency, and, and so determine the uh, uh, inverse covariant matrix and the temperature, which enter explicitly, as I was showing you before in this expression here. And so we extract a random ensemble of ionic configuration distributed uh, according to this probability distribution. For each one of these uh, random configuration, we compute energy, forces, and stress tensor. Now, this is the most computationally intense part because we, we use density functional theory, we use, for example, quantum espresso. This means for each ionic displaced configuration, we need to perform a, a self-consistent density functional theory calculation to get the total energy, the forces, and the stress tensor. Likely, this is not a, a linear response uh, calculation, so it is much cheaper than computing harmonic phonons, but still 
uh, it's uh, the expensive part of our calculation. And then we minimize the free energy by imposing that the gradients of the free energy with respect to our parameters are zero. So we use a gradient descent approach to, uh, to update our value of uh, average position and average and uh, effective force quantum matrix and iterate until we converge to this um, uh, 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 minimum. Okay? So, uh, luckily, we don't. So, if we would do it like that, it would be extremely computationally expensive. We have some tricks. And the tricks is that uh, since the averages that appear in the calculation with the energy are evaluated thanks to a Monte Carlo approach, so we just sum over all the configuration with a weight, uh, we can reuse the ensemble in many, multiple steps, uh, even if the value of our uh, density, uh, uh, our uh, auxiliary uh, harmonic Hamiltonian is changing by imposing this so called reweighting technique. And, uh, but at a certain point, what happens is that we generate an original ensemble around here, for example, we minimize the free energy and uh, we end up with a new ensemble, which is here. But as you can see, if the ensemble was generated here, we don't have here any more, any, any more information about the potential energy landscape here because the configuration will only explore this region. So we need more configurations. And to do to understand when we need to extract more configuration, we use uh, this quantity, which is a quantity using quantum Monte Carlo. And uh, this is called the Conglio effective sample size. And when this quantity, which is an estimation on how many configuration of the original ensemble are good to describe a new ensemble. So when the ratio of the original configuration, which are still quite close to our new, uh, in, uh, our new distribution with respect to the total number of configuration is lower than a, a threshold, we need to extract a new ensemble. So I'm telling this technicalities because in the code this object here is printed, and at a certain point, the code stops if this condition is not met uh, anymore and you need to restart it. Or the code can also restart automatically, as we will see. But uh, since these technicality are useful for the answer session later. So now let's go. This is how the method work, uh, works. And let's go to some uh, uh, results. So first of all, I want to present some results that have been obtained about first order phase transition. Now, in principle, first order phase transitions can be studied also with harmonic theory, but I will present a system in which it fails dramatically. And uh, so how do we compute first order phase transitions? We must find the uh, phase which has the lowest free energy, uh, lowest possible free energy uh, among all phases at the chosen uh, thermodynamic uh, conditions. So for example, if we work at constant volume, is the Helmholtz free energy, the one I was presenting before. If we work at constant pressure, is the Gibbs free energy. And the code prints both, so you can actually choose the, the most appropriate one for your choice. And so I'm here showing you uh, the phase diagram of high pressure hydrogen was also presented yesterday in the keynote lecture. And this time I'm going even higher pressure. So these are all candidate phase before atomization of hydrogen, which is a very interesting material because uh, it is uh, uh, thought to be a room temperature superconductor, if uh, we will ever realize it. <laughs> and these are snapshot of the configuration. And each of these gray dots here is actually a snapshot of the hydrogen in their equilibrium uh, condition at zero Kelvin. So this is uh, this, this quantify the size of quantum fluctuation. So as you can see, uh, hydrogen fluctuates a lot even at zero Kelvin. And this fluctuation is so big that harmonic theory fails in describing correctly this uh, uh, system. So here is the phase diagram. So let's start with the first row here. So this is the static phase diagram, means that we completely neglect phonons and we only look to the enthalpy. In this case, that is result of a, a standard variable cell uh, relaxation. So you, you look only to the energy that came out from a DFT calculation, and you compare the energy or the enthalpy in this case, because we have constant pressure of different phases. And the phase that is the ground state is the one that has lowest ent enthalpy at that pressure, uh, at that value of the pressure. Okay? 
So this is temperature equal to zero. Uh, so what we observe is that in the study phase diagram, there is no effect of isotope mass. So I decided to think that because the electronic, uh, the, the quantum espresso, self-consistent uh, self consistent calculation will not know anything about the mass of our ions, will be fixed particle. And so the uh, hydrogen and the deuterium phase diagram will be exactly the same. Then the second step is that we can include the effect of phonons harmonically. This means we uh, uh, we consider uh, we compute the phonons for each of the structure, and we add the effect of the zero point energy. So we can compute the free energy, or at equal zero is the zero point energy of each one of the structure. Add this contribution to the total energy, and we end up with the harmonic or the quasi harmonic. Uh, that's also called in this case phase diagram because you are assuming phonons are changing with volume. And in this case, you have an effect of the isotope shift because the frequency, the harmonic frequency, change with the mass of the ions. So you already have an effect of isotope shift. But for example, you predict a completely wrong phase diagram, even qualitatively, you see only a and it changed dramatically. So you can see that the phase here change <laughs> from another molecular phase to the atomic phase, actually. And here in the deuterium one, instead, it predicts correctly the sequence of phase with respect to the final di phase diagram, but uh, uh, still it's wrong by a lot from the uh, from uh, with the with respect to the exam calculation. And then we can compute everything within harmonic uh, within the self consistent harmonic approximation, so unharmonically. And what we get is the full. Phase diagram. Now, in this uh, shaded region, is since uh, this theory is a uh, stochastic, so we are computing Monte Carlo averages, we have a stochastic error on the quantities. And so I represented the error uh, here on these plots of the energy as the shaded region. And so we have also error on the, on the uh, error parts on the transition. Now, this is done with so the, the, the electronic level of theory here is quantum Monte Carlo, because it's particularly important for this kind of, uh, to get correctly the uh, phase, phase sequence uh, to go beyond even the chemical accuracy. So uh, we couldn't use simple DFT. But uh, uh, what we observe here is uh, the, the good thing is that we were able to correctly get this, uh, uh, this uh, transition uh, here we, between phase three and a new phase, which matched with an experiment done by Paul Aubert and highly debated, so it was not sure we get exactly this phase transition, which uh, was observed and a bit debated in the past. The nice thing is that we were able to predict uh, at the time in which we published this paper was not yet uh, measured. We predicted the uh, isotope shift. And six months after our paper was uh, public, made public, uh, uh, it was measured actually the same phase transition also in the deuterium, and the isotope effect was of 30 GPA. And if you can see, we predicted that. It and so we got in this extremely challenging uh, system a uh, uh, very nice. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, they are very similar. Uh, sorry, no, oh, uh, this is uh, an error. No, this is six, uh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we equal to six. Yeah, this is equal to six. This is like to be six. Yes. <laughs> Sorry for the. This is six. Yes. <laughs> so. Uh, so we have. Uh, um, so this was about the first order of transition, in which we can go with the. Uh, both static theory and harmonic theory. In the case of second order phase transition, things are much more complex because we have an order parameter, which in this case is a function of the ionic position, which change continuously with temperature. And at the transition temperature, it becomes zero. And so we have a, a two region, a high symmetry phase region, in which this uh, order parameter is zero, and a low symmetry in which the symmetry that constrains the other parameter to be zero is broken. So this is called also a symmetry breaking mechanism uh, in which we have the other parameter that becomes different from zero. OK? And uh, so therefore, to study this phase transition is uh, uh, the atom position must change with temperature. Uh, and so that's, and you can see this also 
in the Landau theory of phase transition has actually a change of the curvature of the free energy around the high symmetry phase. So you can study the phase transition all remaining in the high symmetry phase and studying how the curvature of the free energy change between a saddle point, in this, in this particular is a maximum, local map, to a point with zero curvature to a uh, of the free energy. And so if you do a calculation with harmonic phonons in the high symmetry phase, you will always have a double well potential like this one. And so you will find imaginary phonons, even if at a high temperature, the structure could be stable. And one example, and how to fix this uh, problem, we can do it by doing a linear response, exactly like it's done in uh, uh, density function theory, but this time with the free energy. And so we can compute the linear response of the free energy. So the secondary area of the free energy with respect to the average atomic position. And, uh, and uh, so these are harmonically dressed static phonons and harmonically dressed. And what we uh, observe is now we get a phonon dispersion, which depends on temperature. And uh, the, the cool thing is that we can still constrain the system to be always in a high symmetry phase and study how the phonon dispersion becomes positive with a function of uh, as a function of temperature and the point in which this becomes positive is the critical uh, value so this is when the curvature of the free energy change sign and uh, this is the comparison with experiment these are experimental value by uh, computing actually the phonon dispersion at several temperature and they see this phase transition because this is related to the other parameters so i see this thing go to zero this is what we computed with the uh, uh, the self-consistent uh, harmonic approximation. And this is a comparison. You can actually do something with that. I told you that harmonic frequency don't depend on temperature. They can depend a bit on temperature if you uh, use the electronic temperature in your calculation. So you can use a fermi dirac smearing and put an electronic temperature. And since char density waves uh, are related to nesting mechanism in the fermi surface, people thought that uh, the reason why char density made, uh, waves melts uh, are because uh, if you increase your temperature, the Fermi surface starts mirroring out. And so at a certain point, uh, you lose the phase transition. And this kind of mechanism can be computed harmonically because we don't need an harmonic system in this uh, mechanism. And what you would obtain by computing the phonon dispersion with harmonic uh, phonons, but using the Fermi Dirac. Uh, smearing and the uh, actual temperature is that this phase transition occurs at 800 Kelvin, while experimentally is at 33. So you miss by more than one order of magnitude. And this is uh, and this is one of the, so and we prove that this is uh, true in uh, almost all transition metal in calcogenite. And so we prove that uh, even if the mechanism of uh, uh, the charge density wave seems to be completely related to electronic properties, what actually melts the charge density wave has nothing to do with the smearing of the Fermi surface, is instead the entropy of ions. So ions want to be in a high symmetry phase because they these increase their entropy, and so the overall free energy decrease. Even if the Fermi surface at this temperature is almost equal to the, the zero Kelvin uh, uh, case. And so this is uh, very interesting. So let me show you my last. Uh, actual uh, example of, of result, which is again returning to the original phase of palladium hydride, which I showed you before. And these are the phonon bar, correct with the self consistent harmonic approximation, compared with the harmonic result. This is where the experiment are. So the, the normalization in this case found to be very good. I mean, excellent agreements with the experiment. Not perfectly excellent, but there is a caveat here. Uh, but anyway, you can immediately see how the phonon renormalization works very well. Not only, we can then do what uh, uh, Samuel uh, was uh, also talking about in the previous lecture. We can use this phonon dispersion and plug it into codes that compute uh, superconductive properties. And if we do that, we can compute uh, superconductivity using harmonic photons, using the uh, self-consistent harmonic phonons and comparing with experiments. So we see that 
Indeed, harmonic phonons have the standard isotope effect. So superconducting temperature decrease, increase in the mass, as we expect. But it's not what is observed experimentally. And not only it's overestimated by a lot. When we change the phonons to the actual circumsistent harmonic phonons, the superconducting temperature is suppressed a lot and it gets in much closer agreement with the experiment. And not only, we can also explain the inverse isotope uh, effect with the temperature, which was observed experimentally. Uh, so that's all for this, uh, uh, this lecture. I hope to capture your attention and if there is time for question. So we, this uh, uh, afternoon, we will have some tutorial on the, on the code on how to use it. And uh, there are tutorials and why to install it on your also on your machine beside the, the, the uh, virtual machine, which is already installed at this website. And so there are also other tutorials uh, and more, more materials if you are interested. So thank you very much for the attention. Uh, hi, uh, thank you very much for your uh, dynamic presentation. I really enjoyed uh, I have two questions, and they might be answered at some point during the month. But uh, first, uh, I heard about time temperatures you had um, long playback phonons, and how how are they how are they implemented? It's a super cell or uh, the measure, right? it's a super cell okay so, yes so this uh, so this is a supercell method uh, so since we need to extract uh, let me uh, turn our method work uh, oops like we happen after <laughs> uh, so uh, yes exactly so since we need to extract uh, the ionic uh, configurations uh, in our system, this is a supercell method. It means that we generate uh, structures on the supercell, and we need to compute force of stress on the supercell. So this indeed means you have to study the convergence of all your quantities with the supercell sites. And if you are co computing so uh, force, stress, uh, and energy with an ab initio code, this uh, could become problematic for very large supercell. Then uh, it's true that since uh, all the, uh, free, let me return to the free energy. Uh, okay, yes. So this is the equation of the free energy that we actually use to compute the free energy. So, and as you can see, we split the free energy in two parts. This one is the free energy of the auxiliary harmonic uh, Hamiltonian. And then we have an average over an harmonicity. Okay, this average usually is short range and converge very quickly with the supercell sites. This one is more longer range, and here actually is where the uh, effect of long wavelength phonons enter. And the cool stuff is that uh, you can use all the power that was discussed also by power law of doing this interpolation and using this non analytic effect to split between long range and make and, and create a short range part of this uh, uh, part here of the free energy and calculate on a very dense Q grid. And so to compute properties, you can do that. And uh, this is, there is, we will not do this in the Anson session, but there is explained, I think, in, in uh, one of the, the, we have also forums and there is more than one question in the forums of the code in which we uh, say how to do that. And I think also the frequency asked question on the web page, in which you can interpolate this part here of the free energy to get uh, more converged uh, thermodynamic quantities. And the other question um, how exactly do we define pressure at such a very, very small scale of work we get? Yes, so, so there is a pressure is a thermodynamic quantity, and that can be defined as the derivative. Of the free energy with respect to a strain tensor, okay. And so what we do is uh, like uh, you do in uh, standard DFT, you compute the derivative of the energy with respect to the strain to get the stress tensor. You can do the same here, and we have an equation which is implemented in the code uh, to uh, compute. Actually, let me see. Maybe I have a backup slide. If I have not. Uh, no, I don't have any more. <laughs> so um, we have. Uh, uh, we have implemented the calculation of the full stress tensor, considering an harmonicity, and, and this allows us to do a variable cell relaxation at finite temperature 
including all these effects. And this is, so this afternoon we will compute the thermal expansion of silver. And what we will do is we will do a variable cell relaxation at different temperatures, and we will see how the volume change to compute the, to compute the thermal expansion. So we will have in the stress tensor taking into account the effect of ionic and harmonicity and, and these kind of things. Thank you very much, Lefer. Uh, just very, very quickly, what is the letter for the inverse variant matrix? So, ah, is this called a upsilon? <laughs> it is not a least of this. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so it's a, uh, yeah. <laughs> It was at a certain point we finished the alphabet for the, uh, and so we, we, we were we, we became creative with the with the latex commands for the papers. <laughs> uh, okay. So thanks for answering the talk. I have a, a very general question. If you can go back to this um, picture with all yeah, this one. So you mentioned that this approach somehow as a as a parallel with commercial you know, because you have yeah. But it seems to me that the, the restrictions here is much, much stronger because you want the solution to be always a solution of well, one uh, So state. for one side is, uh, is uh, you are right, but for another side, uh, no, because it, what we want to do with uh, electrons and ions is always very, is, uh, is very different. For example, uh, ions are extremely correlated because uh, if you, ions move in a way that is very correlated. So what, each atom don't move independently of each other. So if you would have to treat ions independently, you would do very badly, even if you would describe their independent wave function very good. So here we use uh, something which includes already correlations in the ions, which are the agent value, the, the, the agent modes, if you want. And we allow agent mode to change variationally. So somehow, we, uh, the agent mode are not kept fixed uh, of ions, so we allow mixing of agent modes. But yes, among each agent mode, the wave function is very restricted, much more than in the DFT. So there are these two different. Because the second part of this was exactly so. Let's say you have a, a perfectly symmetric double wave potential. Yeah. So the, the real solution will not be so. We will, we will have to. Okay. Fix. You have the, yeah. You'll be able to get this. So, so you will. What you will get is uh, each one of the two peaks. Okay. So, uh, you, it's a. So you will have a, um, a degeneracy in that case. So if you move uh, weight from one peak to the other, it will not change your uh, energy. Okay. And so what you will get with the shot is only one of the two peaks. Okay. So if you describe, and this is very similar again to the T. So Sha can describe very well broken symmetry states. If you go to the non-broken symmetry state and you want to, exactly like this is similar. It's not a perfect double well, but it's similar. So if you go in the region where you are across this, uh, this uh, potential ER, you get a worse approximation. Yeah. And if I can comment, I think it's more than a, more than uh, the consham is up before. Yeah, actually, probably. because you have no correlation. So, I mean, you have a, your model is harmonic. Yeah. As a proportion is uh -huh. an independent particle. Yeah. Uh, and then if you dissociate an hydrogen atom, you get a broken symmetry solution, yeah. which is wrong because it should be the... Yeah, the, yeah. The, the but, uh, but, 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 but uh, for example, uh, the, this, say the cool is stuff the cool is that... Is an approximation. No, no, no. So, yeah, I, I agree, but it's a bit different because, for example, I try to solve also the hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen molecule with this. And it's, yeah. it's terrible, indeed. But the, the point is terrible in a completely different way. With so you, should, you have the broken symmetry solution. You can get you, uh, if you want to go in the broken symmetry solution, it's not that bad, actually. But if you want to keep the non-broken symmetry solution, it is bad. But the point is that somehow you describe well the correlation part because you, you will not never put two uh, electrons in the same uh, ion, uh, in, the same, in, the same, uh, in the same ion, but you will have a wave function which is terrible for the, for the, for the electrons. So, yeah, uh, so this is actually related to your uh, last, uh, no, not last, the second last, uh, the second order uh, 
Yes, uh, which has exactly this problem, I think, because I mean, in the high temperature phase, uh, you are probably correct. Uh, I'm not sure how good you are in the low temperature. So actually, what uh, it, the point is that in a very high temperature, so let me take uh, the because uh, uh, the, this the phase you are in the, so, in the symmetric. Phase, if you, right? if you, this is the free energy. Exactly. So if you are in this case here, this is uh, similar to something which is harmonic. So your harmonic uh, theory will describe well this this uh, property here. If you are here and you put yourself in the center, you will describe badly that. But if you are close, uh, so the, the if you are close to the critical point, you will still describe quite in, in very good. The, so the description will be still good uh, of the of the of the system. So you will have still a so uh, a, a, a very usually a very good description. Then it depends on the system. Yeah, it depends on the system. <laughs> but that, that, that was if you were doing just a simple double work potential in which you can do everything analytic and compare. Yeah, and yeah. Can... What we observe in a double well potential is that when this uh, double well start becoming very high, which means you are in the broken symmetry solution, then things uh, get really bad. Uh, but uh, but uh, across the critical point, you still are good. So, and uh, not only, Things get very bad if you fix the symmetry, but as soon as you allow the symmetry broken solution, it gets better because this becomes very harmonic. So, so somehow it's very good here. It's very good here. Yes, around uh, and in fact, I mean, we have some uh, some deviation. It's difficult to say if this is the TFT functional, if this is uh, uh, the sharp approximation, but uh, it's. Mm -hmm. Still, so the results we get are very good in the middle experiment cases. Yeah? Um, so, uh, I'm not an expert, but uh, I was always a bit confused with that about this second order space condition uh, and the number of pictures and so on. So, so if I'm imagining a case mm -hmm. in which it's sort of, sort of uh, become, it's maybe you start like this, but then one of the way go to infinity, the other goes up. Okay, so, so it's a, it's a different uh, So if you say I'm standard, and then one of them go to infinity, the other sort of goes up, then at some point you will have a change of curvature, but then you can still stop. Uh, in uh, this case, it depends a lot. So it depends. I think it, uh, 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 for uh, symmetry reason here it cannot happen. Uh, it depends on the symmetry of the of the. Um, of the so if if you have a system in which this parameter must be zero, I think it should be because the inversion symmetry of this parameter, uh, not completely sure about it, uh, is present in the high symmetry phase. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this means that all the low symmetry phase must have the same symmetry. So you for each solution you must have also the opposite solution at the for the of the parameter. So in another case you you must have something which is reflected in this axis if you have a second order phase transition. You may have more complex scenarios which are not really second order phase transition in which you may have things like that. Or I don't know if maybe more complex group allow, allow. See things where it's not like that, but I don't know if it's called second order. I mean, what's your definition? Of second order? It must be a group, uh, subgroup relation and related to some uh, divergence of. Like I, I, I think that. I, I I actually not a, a real expert on group theory. Maybe there is some group uh, that allowed this in some very complex. Uh, maybe it's, it's multidimensional and non-one dimensional. Maybe there is some way of doing that. But uh, I have never seen a case. So if it's not. Then it's called something else. It's not. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because uh, because so you might here you must have a phase in which the order parameter is zero. To have a second order phase transition because you must have a symmetry break in your mechanism. So if this uh, change somehow. Uh, so first order is that the order parameter is discontinued. Yes, the second order. order is that the order parameter goes to have the first derivative yeah. is discontinued. Yeah. So that so, is second order yeah. because the first derivative is discontinued. So I don't know actually if there are ways in multidimensional to, to have something which do what you say. Probably maybe yes, but not so expert to see it. I know that machine learning is used to solve the yeah. So, yeah. 
Exactly. So here, as I said, this is red because this is the most computationally expensive part, which is the computational energy and costs. And since, uh, with respect, for example, to other methods like molecular dynamics, we generate all the configuration in one shot, and then we have to compute them in parallel. So this is highly parallelizable. We submit just them all together on a cluster. And the cool stuff is that then we have already an ensemble of uh, uncorrelated configurations that can be used to train a machine learning model and then use the machine learning model to go on with this. So actually there is one of the tutorial in the website in which this is uh, done in the, is exactly done. It's uh, you just generate an ensemble, compute that ensemble, and then you use a machine learning model to train a potential on that. And then you do a full, full shell of the training potential and then you compare at the end with the other one. So there is a tutorial we will not do because we have only one hour, <laughs> uh, but uh, it is actually a valid strategy. Other questions? Okay, maybe the last one. So what are the limitations and failures? And from your experience, you already mentioned a little bit, but so, uh, from your experience. And so uh, failures are, where, so this is the probability distribution. So it's a Gaussian and not only agent values, which mean the vibration of the system occurs on straight lines. So if you have a molecular crystal where your uh, uh, molecules spin, so your atoms are, are moving in non-straight lines. And so you are not able to reproduce this kind of rotations within your distribution. And so this is deviating from, and so you will favor a lot, uh, for example, you will unfavor the phase in which you have three molecular rotors. So if we try to study phase transition in a molecular crystal between phases in which molecules are locked and molecules are unlocked, you are expected to overestimate the free energy of uh, phases in which molecules are unlocked. And so a bit, I mean, this is uh, somehow similar of why you, uh, I mean, DFT favor ma uh, magnetic structures uh, because uh, so for the same reason. And uh, it's, it's can seem very different, but actually so, because we, uh, we describe better one of the solution with respect to the other one. And since it's, Somehow, uh, this is variational with respect to the exact energy. The solution we describe better tend to be what we observe as the ground state because we have a lower free energy. If the, the only one or the other the non Ah, yes. Yeah. So this is the, the biggest one. Then, I mean, if you want to use in something which ions really go away from the equilibrium position, this is no more a Gaussian. So, for example, if we want to describe the liquid phase, then I guess it will not work. Uh, but uh, so these are the biggest limitations, actually. Well, I think that one thing, that, I mean, at the beginning, you showed a number of effects in which the thermal effects are important. And I guess thermal conductivity is something that we can't uh, describe. So uh, we have, a, um, so we actually, we can describe okay. thermal conductivity, yes. Um, we have a, an extension. We have also an extension. So this is a static theory, the one I presented here. However, we have uh, uh, generalized this theory to the time-dependent uh, frame. So we have uh, uh, replacing the free energy with the action, and so we can describe the full dynamics of the of the density matrix. And so we can describe thermal. We can compute spectral function. We can describe thermal conductivity. And uh, there is actually one of the tutorial also in the web page, which is okay. Like, how do you do that? I mean, the... we use uh, we can use the Wigner uh, yeah. definition of thermal conductivity and using the spectral function. Are or not? Okay. No. So that is the. I mean, I don't have a slide here, but uh, when you do the time dependent, uh, uh, you get the spectral function of phonons, and you get phonons which are non-Lorentzian line line shape. So actually, this is uh, related, very similar to this uh, thing that I was showing you here. OK, so we can do this uh, calculation here. This is the static uh, anharmonic phonons in which is related to the free energy. If you change the free energy with the action, we have the dynamical. We have something that depends on frequency. And then uh, uh, this can you, you can diagonal. So you have uh, something which has a, you can define a certain energy, which has a real part and an imaginary part. And uh, and you will have uh, you will have a spectral function of phonons, which is no more, uh, uh, which is which is uh, as a finite lifetime, a finite line with.
So it's a, it's a time dependent extension and actually it's solved with a turbo uh, uh algorithm very similar to what was uh, uh, was done in uh, time dependent DFT. So uh, it, uh, it's very, has a lot of parallelism with DFT, this, uh, this theory, because it's self consistent in the end. So almost all the, mech the, the theory that have been developed there can be applied with the, the, the change the, the, uh, also here. Okay. Thank you very much again.